But Wales is a land of beauty. It's a land of castles. It's a land of revival. Over the last 300 years, there have been 15 distinct revivals throughout the nation. And there's many amazing stories which have emerged from the Welsh revivals. Wales was a coal mining country and during one of the revivals they said so many coal miners converted that when you would walk past the entrances to the mines you could hear hymns coming up out of the ground as the miners all sang at work. They used horses and donkeys down in the mines to do different jobs to move the coal around and Before the revival, they said that they would simply curse at them and they would know exactly what to do. After the revival, though, and after they, the miners had cleaned up their language, they actually had to go in and retrain all the horses and donkeys because they didn't understand these new uh, commands they were given that weren't curses. They had circuit judges that would show up for weekly and monthly court appointments and They would show up and they would ask, where's the criminal cases for this week or this month? And they would be told there's no cases whatsoever. People would visit towns and they would be empty. And when they would ask where everyone was, they would be pointed to the local church or chapel. Bars and taverns shuttered their doors and the dance halls closed for lack of business. And at one point, there was a new church being built every eight days in the nation of Wales. The Azusa Street Revival can find its roots in the 1904 Welsh Revival with Evan Roberts. But today in this land of beauty, this land of castles, this land of revival, there is no established United Pentecostal Church. It remains a barren spiritual landscape. There's the remnants of the miraculous. There's the residue of revivals past still there. But there's few present day reminders now except for vacant chapels and churches, which are really just historical landmarks. But God speaks to his people through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 58. And God reveals some more of who he is because he calls himself the builder, the restorer, and the repairer. Now you're getting ready to see a video about the nation of Wales. You're going to see the beautiful countryside. You're going to see uh, some of the cities there. But you won't see people being baptized. You won't see people being filled with the Holy Ghost. But I believe that God is still a builder. I believe he's still a restorer. I believe God is still able to go into waste places and repair something that used to be there but is no longer there. I believe that God has a mighty harvest in the nation of Wales. I believe that there are seeds in the ground from revivals past, from prayers that may have been prayed a hundred years ago. And it seems like nothing has happened. But I believe there is still fruit from those prayers and from what has taken place in that country. I believe God has a work that he wants to do. And so we're asking you for your prayers. We're asking you for your support in this endeavor. This is not something that my family and I can do on our own. We understand that. But I do know that when we do what we can do, when we pray, when we give, and when we go, God steps in and does what only he can do. He begins to do the supernatural. I'm believing God wants to do the supernatural in the nation of Wales, in your life, and in this community as well. Amen. Enjoy this video about the nation of Wales this evening. Oh, 
the glory to the God of love. All the glory to the God of love. Hey Amen. I'm going to ask you wherever you are just to take a moment with me this evening. And uh, if you are able to, I'm going to ask you to join with me in prayer for the nation of Wales. I believe that God has a revival he wants to do. I believe there are people that are hungry and thirsty and seeking after something more. I believe that God is working right now, even as we are traveling, raising, to, uh, raising funds to go there. God is moving right now. So I'm going to ask you to join with me in prayer that God would begin to open people's eyes, that he would begin to move on their hearts. But as we pray, I want us to also pray for this community. I want us to pray for Fredericton. I'm always grateful for what God has done. I'm always thankful for what he's done. And I don't ever want to be ungrateful for what God has done. But I also don't ever want to be satisfied with this is all that God wants to do. I believe God has more that he wants to do in Wales, and I believe God has more that he wants to do in this church, through this church, and in this community. I know we're in a strange circumstance right now, but God is still moving. God is still working. So I'm going to ask you to join with me in prayer this evening, wherever you are. Lord Jesus, we come before you. God, I'm so thankful for every time that you have reached down into the nation of Wales. Lord, I'm so thankful for every revival that you have sent. But Lord, we're coming before you tonight, believing you and trusting you, God, that you want to move upon your people one more time. Lord, I believe that you have souls that you want to save. God, I pray that you would reach down right now, even as we pray, that you would begin to move in hearts, begin to move in lives. Lord, that you would begin to do a work that only your spirit can do. Lord, I believe you and trust you that you are working, that you are moving, that you are touching for your glory in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for this church right now. Lord, I pray for the people of this church. You see the circumstances that they are in, but God, you know, you see. And Lord, you are working, you are moving, you are doing something. I pray that you would reach down right now into homes across this community, whether they're watching or not. Lord, that your spirit would begin to move in homes across this community to people who are hurting, to people that are hungry. Lord, your spirit can move. It can go where we cannot. And Lord, I trust you and believe you for the work that you want to do in this church, in in this community, God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you this evening, one verse. And I understand it's a little bit harder uh, online, watching online. Sometimes our attention span uh, struggles a little bit more than being live. So I'm going to try and be succinct uh, this evening as I preach to you. I'm not going to preach for very long. But I want to preach to you from uh, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, and it simply says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And I want to preach to you from this title tonight, The Law of the Harvest. This verse in Galatians is written by Paul, and it contains a principle which has simply become known as the law of the harvest. We find a variation of this law, not the exact words, but variations of it throughout the scriptures. We find uh, one of Job's friends, they said a lot of things that were not right, but some things they said were right. And one of Job's friends mentions in Job chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. King Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 18, The wicked worketh a deceitful work. But to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. The writer of Ecclesiastes states it this way. In Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. It's a law which really doesn't seem to need much explanation because it is so simple in what it states. You reap what you sow, you get what you plant. We know this holds true in the natural, in, in plants and crops, and, and, and we understand that if I plant a particular seed, if I want to plant cucumbers, I have to plant cucumber seeds. It's not really that deep of a thought. And if I plant cucumber seeds and expect tomatoes, then I, that's just something that's unrealistic because there is a law of the harvest in place which says you reap what you sow. 
We know this uh, holds true for the natural, but it also holds true for the spiritual. Perhaps you've heard this phrase mentioned. Perhaps it's even been stated in regards to you that you're going to get what's coming to you. Some people today would refer to it as karma or what goes round comes round. Sometimes we see this law in effect with, if you have children, we see it in effect with our children when we see them doing something that reminds us of ourselves. Uh, If it reminds us of ourselves, then it's usually something that's pretty good and outstanding. If it's something that's not so good, then that reminds us of our in-laws, that side of the family. But we see the law of the harvest in place here. These are simple, humorous ways, but that law of the harvest plays a much deeper role in our lives as well. Jesus emphasizes the law of the harvest in the Sermon on the Mount when he says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Because this law is in place, it makes me stop. It makes me consider what I am planting in my life. It makes me consider what I am putting into my spirit and into my life. And it also makes me consider what I am putting into the lives of those around me because what is planted will come up in a harvest. It makes me consider what I am planting in my community because what I plant in my community will come up through the soil. So I want to make sure that I am planting good things in the soil. I want to make sure that I'm planting faith in my family and faith in my community. I want to make sure that I'm planting revival seeds in my community. I want to make sure that I'm planting deliverance and joy and peace and love. I want to make sure that I'm putting good things in the soil. There are some differences that we must acknowledge about the spiritual harvest There are a few things, and we're not going to take very long to look at them, but the first thing is that I may not reap where I expected there to be a harvest. Now, when I plant something in the natural, I expect it to grow right there where I planted it, but in the spiritual, I don't always reap where I expect it. I may feel the Lord speak to me to give in the offering or do something like that, and then God begins to work somewhere else because God has a way of connecting things even beyond what I could imagine in my life. So I don't always reap where I expected. Also, something that I must keep in mind, and many of you have experienced this, is I do not reap when I expect all the time. I know that when I plant something I and and I feel that God wants me to do something, I plant faith in the soil, I want God to answer that faith tomorrow. And when it takes a little bit longer, then I begin to struggle with it. But God doesn't always answer and bring to pass the harvest when I expect. But I have to keep something in mind. And that is this, that this law has a promise with it. And the promise is, if you sow, you shall reap. I may not know where I'm going to sow. I may not know when I'm going to sow. But I must believe that if I sow, I will reap. So I want to challenge you, keep on praying, keep on fasting, keep on believing, keep planting the seed, even though you don't see the results you think you should be seeing. Keep a hold of this promise that if you plant the seed, you will reap a harvest. And considering the law of the harvest, it leads me to think about not just that I am sowing uh, seed, uh, good things, but that, but that and that I'm putting things in other people, but it makes me consider that there are things that have been placed inside of me. Many times these are positive, and I'm thankful for those. I'm thankful for pastors and parents and and, and peers, other people that have put good things in my life and the benefits that I'm reaping for those. But if I'm going to acknowledge that there are good things put in my life, I must also acknowledge that not everything sown into our lives is positive. In fact, there are people who are watching or hearing this that you have had very negative things planted in your life. 
many times through no fault of your own. Yet the law of the harvest is in place and you must deal with the harvest of the seed that was planted in your life. There are people who all they knew growing up was anger. Every response was anger. Everything, every situation was dealt with anger. And now when you approach situations, even though you don't want to, that harvest of anger, that seed that was planted becomes your first response. And you push it down sometimes, but you must deal with that harvest. Perhaps you had rejection sown into your life at some point. Perhaps there was a relationship that you experienced severe rejection maybe when you were young or even when you were older. And so now you have to reap the harvest of rejection in your life. And, and, and it shows itself in strange ways in that I can come and I can have faith and I can believe for God to move and touch in people's lives all around me. But all of a sudden when I want God to do something in my life, that harvest of rejection begins to crop up and I come to God expecting him to reject me too. Self-worth issues. Perhaps you were told you would never amount to anything. You would never be anything. And, and so when you come to God and you begin to say, God, I want you to use my life. I want you to take my life and do something with it. All of a sudden, the harvest of those self-worth issues begins to creep up. And you begin to say to yourself, no, there's no way God could use me. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. There's no way God could do something with my life. The harvest. We must reap the harvest. In this day and age, it's almost impossible to talk to any group of people and there not be someone there who has experienced abuse of some kind, whether it's mental or physical or emotional, verbal, whatever it is, that, that even though it's something that may be far in our past and we've worked hard, there are moments when someone says something or something begins to happen and memories begin to creep up and we have to deal with the harvest of that. The list can go on and on as shame and guilt and hatred, things that may have been put in our life and we don't want them there but the seed went in the ground and the law is in place and through no fault of my own through no fault of your own you have to reap the harvest of what someone else has planted in your life this leads me to question the law of the harvest it leads me to question fairness and equity and justice how could God do this and then as I begin to go further I begin to realize what the law means for every single one of us, despite any goodness that we may seem to have sown in our lives. It leads me to realize that every single person has sown things in their lives which they would rather not have put there. I'm not the only one who makes dumb decisions in my life that I regret. It makes me realize that we have all had things put in us which shouldn't have been. No matter how great your upbringing was, we don't live perfect lives. We've all had things put in us that we have to deal with, that we have to recognize and, and, and take care of. When I begin to contemplate all my actions, all my thoughts, all my motivations, I realize there are things in the soil which should not be. And unlike the natural, I cannot go back and dig the seed up to stop the growth. It's there. It's planted. It's in the soil. And then I began to add my sinful nature to the equation of the law. I begin to feel guilt. I begin to feel shame and anxiety. Begin to shake my foundations as I realize there are things in my life that I cannot change because the seed is already in the soil. Now, for some people, it can lead them to a doctrine of works. I've heard people say it that I've done so much bad, I'm going to try and do more good to take care of that. But that you can't live a doctrine of works. You can't plant enough good things to make up for the bad things in your life. Especially when I consider the phrase that Paul prefaces the law with. I'm left even more disheartened because he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. I'm left with the alarming realization that I cannot escape the law of the harvest. I cannot evade the law. I cannot work my way out of the law. I cannot negate the law. I cannot get around the law of the harvest. But there's one more difference about the harvest, the field that I must understand. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37, a familiar passage to many, it says, Jesus speaking here, then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. 
Now, I'm sure no one is surprised that a missionary read a verse about entering the harvest. And I'll do my part and say, if you're not involved in the harvest, then get involved in the harvest. You need to be about the Father's business. But there's something else I want us to see from this passage. You see, while I cannot change the principles of Scripture laid down, while I cannot change the laws set in place, including the law of the harvest, there is nothing in the natural that I can do to fix that. I am here to tell you this evening that I am so thankful that there is one who can because this verse mentions someone. It mentions the Lord of the harvest. There is nothing that I can do in and of myself that can change what is put in the ground, but there is the Lord of the harvest who can come through my life. He can come through my circumstance. He can come through my situation. He can change the seed that has been planted and he can change the harvest in my life. The Lord doesn't operate in the natural. He is not bound by the laws of the natural like I am. Because the natural says what goes in the ground, the same has to come out of the ground. But the Lord of the harvest operates in the supernatural. He goes outside of the laws of nature and he can change what has been planted in your life. Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 37 and 38. He says, And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him into every seed his own body. Now Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the rapture and he states to them, he explains to them what takes place. But I believe this is a kingdom principle that Paul is referring to as well. And what Paul is explaining is he says that, that when we die, that is what is put in the ground. But when the rapture takes place, it is a glorified body which comes out of the ground. Just as Jesus was on this earth and, and, and he had to deal with the physical restrictions of this earth before he went in the ground and came and was resurrected, he had to deal with the physical restrictions of this earth. He had to deal with things like you and I. He, he, although he did miracles and stepped outside, generally his life had to be lived within the confines of his humanity. But after the resurrection, we see Jesus, his body is different. He no longer uses the door to get in the room like he did before because he has a different body. He now just walks through the wall. He now just shows up in the room. And this is what Paul is explaining, that what goes in the ground is something different that comes out of the ground at rapture. But I believe, like I said, that this is not just speaking of the rapture, but it is a kingdom principle that what goes in the ground is not what has to come out of the ground. Because he says, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. You see, God decides the body. He decides the outcome. What goes in the ground does not have to come out of the ground. You you know this. This is how God can take an alcoholic. He can take an addict. He can take a cheat. He can take a liar. He can take the abused. He can take the abuser. He can can take the immoral and he can make a preacher. He can make a pastor. He can make a Sunday school teacher. He can make an usher a greater because God decides the body. This is how the prophet Isaiah can state that he gives beauty for ashes. He gives the oil of joy for mourning. He gives the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I want to tell you that God can give peace to the fearful. He can give joy to the depressed. He can give love to the abused. He can give purpose to the wounded because God decides the body as it pleases him. The prophet Joel also tells us of what the Lord of the harvest is capable of in Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. Because it's not just about something new coming out of the ground. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 25, God speaks to His people and He says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now, Spurgeon was a famous preacher of many years ago and I came across this quote and I don't usually read long quotes but 
It was too good to pass up. And so I'm going to talk you through what Spurgeon had to say about this first phrase in this verse. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Because this is what the Lord of the harvest is capable of as well. Spurgeon says this, lost years can never be restored literally. That simply means that you can't get back yesterday. You can't get back your 20s. It doesn't matter what you dress like, how you act. You can't get back what you once were. It's gone. Spurgeon says time once passed is gone forever. It's gone. You can't have your teenage years back that you wasted, your 20s back that you're wasted, last week that you wasted. You can't have it back. And so Spurgeon says the locust did not eat the years. He says the locust ate the fruit of the year's labor, the harvest of the field. So the meaning of the restoration in this passage here, this verse, is not a restoration of the years. God is not saying that I will give you those physical years back. So it must be a restoration of the fruits and the harvest which the locusts consumed. Spurgeon says, you cannot have back your time, but there is a strange and wonderful way in which God can give back to you the wasted blessings, the unripened fruit of years over which you have mourned. The fruit of wasted years may yet be yours. I want to tell someone tonight that he can restore what may have been lost in your life. I don't care what direction you took. I don't care how far off the path you went. God is a restorer of the fruits of of those years. He's the Lord of the harvest. He can decide. He can restore the joy of your salvation. He can restore your ministry. Oh, I know it may look different now how God fulfills it, but why don't you let him worry about it? He can restore a ministry. He can restore missed callings. He can restore purity in your life that you thought was God. God can do it because he is the Lord of the harvest. And I'm closing this evening. I close with John chapter 12 in verse 24. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth there alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. I'm always amazed at this. Not just at other people, but within my own life too, because we're human. I'm just amazed though. Here's what I'm amazed at. Is how much stuff we can put in the ground. How much pain, how much heartache, how much anger, whatever it is. How good we are about putting stuff in the ground. And burying it deep in the ground. But never letting it die. We are so good at bearing emotions and pains and hurts and things so that we don't want anyone to touch them, anyone to come because it's too much. But we don't ever let those things die. Jesus says, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it will abide there alone. There are people that are hearing this That right now in your life, you have parts of your life that are dormant, that are dead. Because you have put something in the ground. You have buried it, but you have never let it die. There's areas of your life that are blocked off. You've blocked them off even from God. That you, it, it, it could be whatever service going on in the greatest altar call. And you, you know there's a point that you will pray unto, until. There's a, a point that you will go to. But then when you, you can't dig too much farther than that. Because you know what's underneath there. And you know it's still alive. Someone can say something. And you feel it stirring. Something begins to happen. You feel it stirring. A preacher preaches and we call it conviction and it reaches down into that past all the soil that we buried it under and it finds something that's still alive. Let me tell you, if you don't let those things die, nothing's going to come from them. There will be parts of your life that no fruit will come from. But Jesus says, 
if it die, if you are willing to let it die, the things that you have put in your life that you regret, the wasted years maybe, things that other people have put into your life, through no fault of your own maybe, if you let it die, it will bring forth much fruit. There are people that are hearing this right now and God is simply waiting on you to let that thing die and you will be amazed at the fruit that comes out of your pain. The fruit that comes out of your hurt. That bitterness, that betrayal, that hatred that used to be there. You will be amazed at what begins to spring up out of that. You know what we call that? We call that a testimony. God is wanting to raise a testimony out of all those seeds, those bad seeds that you have put in the ground, the regrets that are in your life, the guilt, the shame. He wants to raise a testimony. He wants those things to bring forth fruit in your life. Let me just say this. Your family deserves for there to be fruit in every part of your life. Your church deserves for there to be fruit in every part of your life. Your workplace deserves to have your testimony. This community deserves to have that testimony of what God can do. How do I let it die? In Scripture, dying is always tied with repentance. I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to ask for forgiveness for seeds I've planted in my life. Whatever they may be, I'm not going to go through the list again. You know what's in your life. We're, We're good with that, but it gets a little strange when we think about, I need to ask for forgiveness for things I didn't even put in my life. I was the one abused and had no choice. How do I ask for forgiveness? Here's what you ask for forgiveness for. For not trusting God with that pain. For not trusting God with that hurt. For burying it and trying to take care of it on your own. You need to ask God to forgive you for you trying to deal with the circumstance all by yourself. But let me tell you, if you are willing to let that die, if you are willing to put it in the ground and not just bury it, but if you are willing to let it die, God controls the body he controls the outcome you would be amazed at when you put it in the ground and let it die what God will bring forth up out of that soil you will be amazed at what God can do with a life that is broken and there's hurt and there's pain and there's sins in it It, you could have lived for God for 20 years and there's still those things there but if you put it in the ground and give it to God you will be amazed at the harvest that he brings forth in your life it's a promise found in scripture if it die it will bring forth fruit I want us to pray right now wherever you are I know it may not be the most comfortable place to pray and I know this may be something where you may need to think about it for a little bit and take this to a personal place of prayer because we're not together in an altar service I understand that but I want us to pray together and I want us to pray Lord help me we all have things in our life. We all have seeds that shouldn't be there. But Lord, I want, I want fruit in my life. I want testimonies in my life of your healing power, delivering power, saving power. Let's join together in prayer wherever you are. Lord Jesus, we come before you. God, I'm so thankful that you are the Lord of the harvest. Lord, that I don't have to just settle for what was put in my life. I don't have to allow those bad choices and regrets and decisions just to sit there in the soil and that harvest to come to pass. I don't have to let abuse and bitterness, I don't have to let those things be there. But God, you are the Lord of the harvest. And I am praying right now that you would reach into somebody's heart. Lord, I know it's it's painful, it's difficult to begin to uncover some of those things we've had them buried for so long divisions and strife and and all of those i but i pray lord that we would have the courage that we would have the boldness to reach through the soil of our life 
the years, Lord. And we would reach down and we would, through repentance, allow those things to begin to die. And Lord, I thank you right now for the fruit that will come to pass. I thank you right now for the testimonies that you will bring to pass in people's lives. For testimonies that will affect families and change communities and change workplaces because of what you have done. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.